today on Christian World News, speaking up for those who could not speak for themselves, urging the U.S. government to spotlight global persecution. And he's being remembered as a towering man of faith and a general for God. A look at the life and spiritual legacy of the Reverend David Wilkerson. Plus, changes coming to Cuba, how the communist nation is shifting gears and how the church is playing a role. And welcome to Christian World News. I'm Mark Martin. George Thomas and Wendy Griffith are on vacation. A U.S. government commission is urging the Obama administration to act against countries that persecute religious minorities. That's because global persecution is on the rise. Paul Strand reports from Washington. It's not getting better out there in many nations for those who wish to worship freely. In many countries, certainly, religious persecution has uh, become worse over the past several years. That's the word from the U.S. government group that keeps an eye on religious freedom around the world. Their new annual report highlights countries like Vietnam, where Christians and other believers face imprisonment and torture. They took me to the station and they tortured me. They used something to tie my thumb and one of my toes and hung me on the wall for three hours. The government says there is freedom of religion, but there is a lot of persecution among Christians and other tribes. The cover of the commission's new report shows the funeral of Shabazz Bhatti. He's the Pakistani official killed for fighting against Pakistan's blasphemy law, which promises death to those who insult Islam's founder, Muhammad. I believe in Jesus Christ, who has given his own life for us. I know what is the meaning of cross, and I'm following of the cross. And I'm ready to die for a cause. I'm living for the, my community and suffering people, and I will die to defend their rights. The commissioners are asking the U.S. government to now blacklist Egypt for failing to prevent or respond to what they call a sharp deterioration of religious freedom. We've seen a ratcheting up of attacks on uh, the Christian minority, in particular the very large Coptic Orthodox Christian minority. Whole nations may soon see Christianity disappear within their borders because of persecution. Particularly in North Africa and the Middle East, Christian populations are dwindling rapidly to the point in some countries where they're facing extinction, like in Iraq. <laughs> These are the eight nations already marked by the State Department for particularly severe violations of religious freedom. And the commissioners want the U.S. to add these six countries as religious persecutors. Commissioners say nations will actually help themselves if they work to end religious persecution. Where there's religious freedom, there are political and civil rights, there is economic prosperity, and there's security and stability. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Joining us now in our Washington bureau is Nina Shea. She's commissioner on the U.S. CIRF. Nina, the Obama administration hasn't designated any countries of particular concern since they've been in office. Does that say anything, would you say, about their commitment to religious freedom? Well, I think it's, it reflects their general lack of focus on religious freedom as an important and priority human right. And uh, it's also reflected in the fact that we're finally now, two, over two years later, finally getting a position filled for religious freedom ambassador at the State Department. And so, um, yes, I think it, it really shows a neglect. What happens when a country is designated a top offender? Well, this is a requirement under the International Religious Freedom Act passed by Congress in 1998. And it means that you are one of the worst countries in the world for religious freedom if you are designated. You, uh, you, what, what we see in these countries on the list are egregious, ongoing, and systematic persecution. That's the statutory standard. Uh, it requires presidential action. It could be economic sanctions, um, which would be the most intense um, uh, response, or it could be a simple day marsh, a, a, a raising, a using of the bully pulpit um, for these particular countries. So there's a range of actions the United States government could take in response, but it is required to act. Nina, you're recommending Egypt now be added to the list. What's your concern there? Well, we're very concerned about the Christians. Uh, the Coptic Christians are the largest minority of any kind in the Middle East, um, and they form about 10% of the population of Egypt. They are an ancient faith um, from 2,000 years ago, 
and they are being assaulted by extremists, by terrorists, by Islamists within society. Uh, their churches have been bombed. We saw that on New Year's in Alexandria. We saw a church bombed um, at their Christmas celebration a, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and then there's individual attacks. There are pogroms on their villages. Um, a church burned just a couple months ago. So they're in a very uh, vulnerable position. Uh, the government at the same time, in addition to failing to protect them, um, also fails to uh, provide justice. So when they are attacked, uh, no one serves time for that. No one is put on trial, or if they're put on trial, uh, it's dismissed eventually. No one is convicted. Um, that gives a green light to extremists that the Christians are, are, are just, uh, they can be murdered with impunity. They can be murdered and terrorized to drive, with the purpose of driving them out, with the purpose of religious cleansing and there won't be any consequences. Now we're seeing more Christians leave Iraq. What's going on there? Iraq has been suffering a long time from extremism since, uh, well, at least since 04, and when that was the first attack of coordinating bombings against Christian churches. It's intensified. And Christians are not just caught in the crosshair. Um, they're actually targeted for their faith. Again, the government has not protected them as they should. Furthermore, the government has uh, marginalized them. When their villages um, are uh, come up for, for being put online on the um, electricity or water or sewage uh, or sc for schools or road building, Christian villages are excluded in the northern part in the Nineveh Plain area. So that's been going on for a number of years as well. So they're getting the distinct picture that they're not wanted. And half of them have left. And we're wondering now when the other half are going to leave because, it, again, it's an extremely vulnerable minority. This is a small minority. It's about, it started out about 1.5 million in, in 2003. Now uh, we're down to about half a million, 400,000. No one really knows, but it's a vastly diminished uh, population there. And church leaders mm -hmm. are now speaking out and saying that it could be a religious genocide. Okay, Nina Shea, thanks again for being with us. We appreciate your insights. Thank you. To learn how you can help those suffering for their faith, visit our website, cwnews.org. There you'll find links to some of the ministries who serve the persecuted church. Christians around the world are mourning the loss of a passionate and prophetic voice. David Wilkerson, founder of Teen Challenge and Times Square Church, has died. The 79-year-old minister was killed and his wife Gwen was badly injured in a head-on collision in East Texas this week. Now Christians are remembering the powerful legacy of his ministry. Heather Sells has more. David Wilkerson inspired Christians around the world with his passion for saving lost souls. In 1958, he felt God calling him to New York City to minister to gang members and drug addicts. He tells of his encounter with notorious gang leader Nikki Cruz in the best-selling book The Cross and the Switchblade. It later became a movie starring Pat Boone. You could cut me up into a thousand pieces and lay them in the street. And every piece will still love you. It did damage good in my brain. And in my heart, I began to question. And for two weeks, I could not sleep thinking about love. Wilkerson went on to found Teen Challenge, a biblically-based recovery program for drug addicts. In 1987, he returned to Manhattan to found the non-denominational Times Square Church. In the aftermath of 9-11, Wilkerson's leadership was elevated as he called the city to repentance. If you're a praying Bible believer, you know instinctively in your heart that God is trying to speak to this nation and the world through this. Oh God, forgive our sins against you. Forgive our sins against you. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Wilkerson's heart for revival was a hallmark. In one of his most stirring sermons, he preached about anguish for the unsaved. We've held on to our religious rhetoric and our revival talk, but we've become so passive. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. I think Brother Dave was really at war with the status quo. He, uh, he could not tolerate religiosity, so it's kind of a funny thing that God called him to pastor. 
uh, but his many words that he spoke of warning about zeal for the Lord and holiness and anguish and faithfulness, uh, they were a voice that were calling the body of Christ. I literally think he was speaking for the Lord as what we would say a modern day prophet. Wilkerson's death leaves a rich legacy, but his ministry and vision will also be dearly missed. In this last devotional blog, he wrote this, to those going through the valley and shadow of death, hear this word. Weeping will last through some dark, awful nights, and in that darkness you will soon hear the Father whisper, I am with you. I cannot tell you why right now, but one day it will all make sense. You will see it was all part of my plan. It was no accident. It was no failure on your part. Hold fast. Let me embrace you in your hour of pain. Beloved, God has never failed to act but in goodness and love. Heather Sell, CBN News. A great man of the faith, David Wilkerson's son released the following statement following his father's death. We rejoice knowing dad lived life to the fullest, obeying God with devotion and loving Jesus radically. He was known for his unlimited faith. He believed that God could change the lives of gang members and transform the most desperate drug addicts. He believed that a dynamic church could be launched in the heart of Times Square, New York City. He believed he could be a man who loved his wife and children well, and he did. He will be missed. Coming up on Christian World News, economic trouble and Cuba's aging leadership, why it could mean big changes ahead for the communist nation and the future of its people. CWnews.org, your constant news source on the World Wide Web. Find daily updates on the global church. Watch the weekly broadcast. Three former presidents come together to honor the life and ministry. Also available in podcast. The in-depth insights into our reporter blogs. Taliban kidnapped at least 18 in South Peru, Korean Christians. Your online news source for complete coverage of the global church. A humble shepherd. Who am I to lead your people out of Egypt? And an evil king. Speak up, insect. Battle over the future of a nation. And tell your people, I will never let them go! In the latest Superbook episode, you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. Let my people go. Come explore with Chris. Didn't see that coming. Joy. I'm not good in these kinds of situations. And Gizmo. Maybe I should try my magic card shuffle. As they discover how God does amazing things through ordinary people. For your gift of $25 or more, you'll receive Superbook's newest DVD, Let My People Go, the original Superbook Exodus episode, and trading cards. Your gift will help create future episodes and bring God's Word to the next generation. All right. It's super power for super kids. Hi, I'm Terry Mewson. At CBN, we're here to pray for you all year long. But each spring, the entire staff of CBN sets aside a special week of prayer to pray for your needs. We care about you and the things that are happening in your life. No matter how big or small your requests, we want to pray for you. Please call us or mail your prayer request today. It's our privilege to pray for you. Welcome back. After more than 50 years in power, Cuba's leadership is aging, and their fervor for communism may be lessening as well. Recently, the government will allow some citizens to start small businesses. As Stan Gita reports, churches are helping their members take advantage of the changes. A feeble Fidel Castro, 84 years old, made a surprise appearance at the Communist Party Congress, a Congress that for the first time in its history did not include him on the powerful Central Committee. That post went to his brother Raul, who admitted that Cuba has a succession problem. He made a surprise recommendation of term limits for politicians, including himself. We have reached the conclusion that it's recommendable to limit to a maximum of two five-year consecutive terms all the state's fundamental political positions. But that's not the only problem that keeps Cuba among the poorest nations in the Americas. The government employs eight out of every 10 Cuban workers, a dead weight the economy can't sustain. 
Castro knows the country has to shed its communist baggage, but as the new party leader, he made a pledge to the faithful. To defend, preserve, and continue to perfect socialism and never allow the return of the capitalist regime. Cuba right now is in a state of great confusion between shifting from purely a socialist communist system to a quasi uh, market system, not quite at the acceleration of China or Vietnam, and not knowing uh, where they're going, but being very cautious not to let this whole thing get out of hand. Last year, Raul promised to reduce the bloated government payroll by laying off half a million workers. While the massive government layoffs have not yet happened, the uncertainty has left many Cubans on edge. That's why many evangelical churches are helping their members create their own jobs. What the more aggressive churches have been doing is allowing their, the individual members of the churches to partner with organizations outside of Cuba that would help them to start small businesses and therefore become tithers, for example, to the church and supporters for the social programs that the churches are running. With the help of Echo Cuba, Baboon's Miami-based charity, Cuban evangelicals have started more than 1,200 small businesses. We select uh, Cubans within uh, churches that are entrepreneurial. Uh, we help them write a business plan, guide them in their process of how to start their business, and then bring uh, to them a business in a box. Uh, everything they need to start the business is basically purchased outside of Cuba and brought to Cuba so that they can get things going. But these budding entrepreneurs first have to unlearn what the communist government has taught them for the past 50 years. The socialist model of Cuba starting in 1959, one head, everything uh, coming down. Uh, they, they really don't understand uh, how to meet together, how to create uh, co a collaboration with each other, how to uh, make decisions in a meeting format. All those things that we take for granted, they don't understand it. So if churches are to help members survive Cuba's economic crisis, they must learn the basics of a free market economy. And once Christians start their own businesses, other freedoms may follow. The freedom to be able to operate not only um, in the marketplace, but also in their uh, place of worship uh, freely from without any kind of restriction from any form of government. Stan Jeter, CBN News. Coming up, we'll tell you why a church started by one of Christ's disciples is now facing new dangers. We asked CBN.com users how we could make our website easier to use, and we listened. This is really easy to read and move through. The information opens up a whole lot quicker. Yeah, yeah it's much faster. There's mm -hmm. everything I'm interested in right here. A click of a mouse. The new CBN.com has been redesigned, making it faster to find your favorite 700 Club stories, musical guests, our online community, and special features. Anyone can enjoy this new site. Visit the new CBN.com today. Come on and cross over to the all new Cross Country Radio from CBN.com. Cross Country, where country meets the cross. There are Three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. You'll hear real Christian country from great country artists like Craig Morgan. That's what I love about Sunday. I sing along as the choir sways. Every verse of amazing grace. Great Christian and country classics. He touched me. CBN.com's Cross Country. It's where you'll find some of the best homemade recipes. Plus, enjoy down-home stories that will touch your heart. The all-new Cross Country Radio, where country meets the cross. Cross Country. It's only on CBN.com. I came a slave to it. It got really, really addictive for me. I say, God, you have to deliver me out of this. of that woman of God laid her hands on me. My God instantly delivered. 
I didn't have any more feeling to smoke, to use crack cocaine. I didn't want any of that anymore. And if he could change me, he could change anyone. Egypt's cops are some of the oldest Christian communities in the world. But now many Egyptian Christians are considering leaving the country. They fear radical Islamists have hijacked the nation's democratic revolution. Gary Lane has the story from Cairo. The Egyptian revolution brought hope and opportunity to a people long oppressed by an unpopular dictator and his subordinates. Egyptian Coptics joined Muslims in the Tahrir Square protests. But so far, the freedoms they've desired remain elusive, and this minority Christian community is under siege. In terms of the actual number of attacks on cops, they have increased since Mubarak stepped down. And that has a lot of uh, cops worried. Is this a harbinger of the future? Many Christians are now considering leaving the country. So far, 2011 has been a tragic year for Egypt's Christians. It began on New Year's Day with a horrific suicide bombing at St. Mark's Church in Alexandria. Security guard Magdi Wahib was at the church entrance when services concluded shortly after midnight. I suddenly found myself blown inside the church. I didn't lose consciousness, but I felt severe pain in my abdomen, hand, and sides. Wahib was taken to a hospital where he underwent surgery. A piece of shrapnel nearly seven inches long was removed from his abdomen, along with 30 inches of his intestines. Wahib was among nearly 100 Christians injured in the attack. 23 people were killed. The Christians here at St. Mark's Church in Alexandria certainly know that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. They'll persevere. Their church may even grow as a result of this incident. And they're determined to fight for a new future here in Egypt, one where their rights are honored and they have religious freedom. Christians say they're not treated as equals, even though they were the majority here for more than 1,000 years. Today, they are only about 13% of the population. 86% of Egyptians are Muslim. Christians rarely receive government permission to build new churches. These members of a church in Giza near Cairo told CBN News they obtained a building permit after a lengthy 10-year battle. Then, last November, security police laid siege to their partially constructed building. At least two Christians were killed, dozens were injured in the attack. Hit by a rubber bullet, taxi driver Nasir Fakri Bakit is now unemployed because he lost sight in his left eye. The policemen inside the church were insulting us and beating us as if we were criminals. They shouted Allahu Akbar as if we Christians are not people, as if we are not human, only like animals without any rights, as if we are not Egyptians. And police and militant Muslims aren't the only ones attacking Coptics. A new wave of assaults are coming from the Egyptian army. This is a home video of a military attack against a monastery near Alexandria last January. After local police abandoned their station, the monks at St. Beshoy's built a wall at the monastery entrance to protect themselves from intruders. The army responded, sending in 100 soldiers with tanks and light artillery to destroy the wall. Six people were injured, including a monk whose spleen had to be removed because of the attack. We were very sad because we didn't know why the army attacked like this. The army is supposed to protect us, not beat us and torture us. We are innocent, we pray and try to help people. That's all we are doing. Christians say the incident here at the Bashoi Monastery is just another example of why they need protection from a new government. They say there must be changes in their new constitution that include them. But the strongest political group at this time, the Muslim Brotherhood, insists that Islamic law, Sharia, remain the basis of Egyptian law. It opposes democratic changes in the constitution that would grant equal rights and allow Christians and Muslim women to become president. Human rights advocate Munir Bashara spends most of his spare time on Facebook, sharing democratic ideas with young people. He says many Egyptians are religious, but will not support a theocratic government, similar to the one in Iran. He warns voters against being fooled by the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood, they are speaking about democratic, but inside themselves, they, if they're going to get the power, it will be last democratic and going to be dictatoric again. Paul Marshall says the United Nations and the U.S. State Department are naive and overly optimistic about the Muslim Brotherhood. They're saying, well, the younger generation in, in the Brotherhood, 
may be much more open. I think that's true. But the 23-year-olds aren't running the Brotherhood. And Marshall says the Hamas experience in Gaza is a harbinger for Egypt's future under the Brotherhood. Hamas is the Muslim Brotherhood of the Palestinians. They won an election, and there's been no election since. And they killed off the Palestinian Authority opponents. And that's why many Coptics may leave. They fear what may come. Still, many like Father Halmanut to the Beshoi Monastery say they'll stay. The church has existed in Egypt for 2,000 years and will survive no matter what happens. We are trusting in God and we are not afraid. Jesus told us that the people against us use the hand of human beings. But we have the hand of God. The one who's covering us will save us. Gary Lane, CBN News, Cairo, Egypt. We created this website as a place where kids can learn the Bible in a whole new way. Kids will love Superbook.tv. Their games, the ability to create your own personal Superbook characters. We even have a place for kids to listen to music on Superbook Radio. Superbook is CBN's animated series that teaches the Bible through the eyes of two friends and their robot sidekick. We're going to tell stories all the way from creation to Christ's return. The website also teaches kids life lessons. Parents can spend time online with their kids learning about the Bible. Superbook and Superbook.tv are entirely gospel-centered, and by supporting it, you'll help bring God's Word to children all over the world. We're reaching a new generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Together, we can give today's kids the truth of the Bible in a fun and exciting way that will change their lives. Visit Superbook.tv today. Hi, I'm Christy Watts. Okay, so I have a question for you. How's life? Listen, I know we all face challenges and we all go through difficult times, don't we? I mean, I know I do. But did you know that the staff right here at CBN sets aside a special week of prayer each spring just to pray for you? Because we care about you. We care about what's going on in your life. Listen, there are absolutely no prayer requests that are too big or even too small. We just want to pray for you. So please call us or mail in your prayer request today. Christian World News, your window to the global church for stories of revival, persecution, relatives and fellow Christians born in the first country over the international day I'm George Thomas in Baghdad and coming up on the broadcast an exclusive interview and the impact of Christian leaders. Watch Christian World News. Finally this week, a young mother is alive today thanks to CBN's Operation Blessing in China. The 29-year-old traveled to Beijing with their husband and they needed to get help for her son who is deaf. While the couple was there, the mother suffered a stroke. Doctors said if she survived, she would more than likely be completely paralyzed. Operation Blessing China was able to raise more than $4,000 to pay for treatment. Doctors are calling her recovery a miracle. It sure is. It's wonderful to see how Operation Blessing is helping people worldwide. That's all for this edition of Christian World News. Thanks again for joining us this week. Georgia Wendy will be back next week. We'll see you then. God bless you. <laughs>